Okay, ready? All right, Omitopo, uh, bow in the four great vows. I vow to deliver innumerable sentient beings. I vow to cut off endless vexations. I vow to master limitless approaches to Dharma. I vow to attain Supreme Buddhahood. Okay, hello to you all. Um, today's topic has been one of, uh, of an evolution and uh, it changed dramatically over the week. Uh, and it started wanting to continue on with Wei Ning and mine but then I started thinking about the, the three Dharma seals or three marks of existence. And um, that was something that just be, I just began to contemplate more and more. And as I began to contemplate it, I focused on the part that I didn't understand the most. Um, and uh, in terms of looking at it. Um, so the, the three Dharma seals are the seals that, uh, that all masters say are what is necessary in order to, to study Buddhism. It embodies the main principles of Buddhism. And without um, contemplating and understanding these uh, seals, then it is difficult to make progress um, in in uh, in Buddhism, uh, and it's uh, the first one is um, impermanence and Nietzsche. Um, the second is no self and Atman, and the third is suffering dukkha. Now the third is a little bit of a wild card because in the Theravadan practice it is dukkha but in mahayana practice um it is nirvana uh and as, as i will be going into that one a little bit more in detail when we talk about mahayana oftentimes in the sutras now i'm reevaluating the term mahayana um especially in some of the sutras where it uh it is understood to mean the this Mahayana vehicle of, of of practice, but it is better read meaning the Buddha. And so when when in the sutras they talk of Mahayana, they're not necessarily talking about a particular way, they're talking about Buddha. And that's a very interesting one because then we have to try to look at and and say, what is the Buddha? And there's many, many sutras that go into that in great detail um, in terms of that, but it's something that literally is, is, is inconceivable. Um, there is a third one oftentimes used um, by, uh, by Tibetans and Yogacharans, uh, which is emptiness. But I think emptiness is, is kind of like a an extra cherry on top. Um, and I think that emptiness embodies the three Dharma seals. And it's not something that is separate from, from any of them. And these seals are not separate from, from themselves. So we could add emptiness, but I don't think that emptiness adds anything to it. It is just the definition of, of this, but the definition of nirvana as we will see embodies the emptiness which is is um the 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 buddha uh, uh mind and um so these are the things in terms of it when we look at impermanence it's difficult for us to to accept it oftentimes and as a result of it we suffer it could be the um uh, the ending of, of eating an ice cream cone, and then you suffer from that because you, you still want to eat more ice cream. You can't accept the fact that the ice cream is gone. Hmm, sounds kind of like relationships as well. You may have a good relationship and all of a sudden it, it ends. 
And so you, you cannot accept the impermanence of the relationship, or it could be somebody that passed away or an animal or your job or, or whatever. But all of these things, they, they lead to, to suffering and dissatisfaction. Um, we do not understand that. And, and more importantly, I think even if we understand it, and this is for you, for all of you, because you're a little bit further along than most people that would listen to a lecture like this, um, you, you understand it, but you don't accept it. And that's a, a difficult thing to do is to accept the impermanence of things, but it can work in another way. And that's that it can work that when things are going bad, you understand because of impermanence that that too will pass. And, and that's important to understand that because sometimes we can go through a series of, of misfortunes in our life and thinking this is our lot in life. But in any particular time, there may be moments where even within all of those things that are happening to us, we still can, can uh, appreciate the present moment. Um, what happens is it's difficult for us to accept the change in circumstances. If we were imprisoned, we are now unable to leave the cell that we're in, but the mind itself is not imprisoned. We imprison the mind. And so everything that we see is, is in this way, we want to be able to, to look at things with this idea of that this impermanence um, and, and truly accept it. It's not understand it. We already understand things are impermanent. You just, you'd have to be completely void of senses to not understand that things change around you. And uh, the idea of no self is another one uh, of, of the Dharma seals, where um, it, it is uh, self is Atman, and Atman means um, no self. But um, as some recent scholars have pointed out, it is not necessarily that it's no self as much as not self. And this is kind of an interesting distinction here where we we go this is not self then what then what is it 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 isn't self but it's not necessarily saying oh there isn't a self there because we still have self nature of mind but it is this notion of clinging to an ego a life and being or a personality or having a conceit of self that uh that is something that is erroneous to us. We are looking for this, and this is, this is ignorance on our part. It's a fundamental ignorance. But if we accept this Dharma seal, then we can move along as well. The, the third one, and, and I'm only going to talk about the three um, of Dukkha. We'll start with Dukkha uh, as that was a Theravadan viewpoint of it of suffering that that there's the suffering there and that leads us directly to the four noble truths and so when we see the four noble truths we see that there's suffering the causes of suffering the cessation of suffering and the path and yet in the mahayana we we change that around and say no this is uh everything is empty. In fact, there is no path there. There is nothing of that way. But it's an interesting one because we, we cannot just simply just uh, thumb our noses at the Four Noble Truths. They, they're called Noble Truths for a reason. Uh, although when we see it, we, we begin to, at, in the practice of Mahayana, to understand that these things too are non-existent. That's why these, these Dharma seals also called the marks of existence, but they're actually not existent. So when we approach the Four Noble Truths from this viewpoint, it changes things. And we see that this idea of suffering is, is really an apparition or a phantasm, an illusion. And it's not really there. 
which brings us to the Mahayana approach for the third one, um, which is not suffering, but nirvana. And that's interesting because it's putting more of a positive slant on it and saying that if we do not cling to these things, if we also accept it, this is very, very important. Accepting it is uh, accepting the truth of the Dharma. This is very, very powerful that we have to accept the truth of the Dharma. And we can't just be sitting on the fence and going, I don't know, you know, maybe I can do this or maybe I can do that. You know, I, I once knew a person that was a Christian and, and I asked her, why are you a Christian? You're Chinese normally. She was, I used to be a Buddhist, but the Christians offered me food. So, so I took it. And so now I'm a Christian. Um, no. It's an interesting approach to that and, and serve the Christians very well for a couple of thousand years. Um, but I don't know if it's a solid basis to establish uh, your philosophy in terms of existence. Um, but here, the idea of nirvana is interesting because we have to look into what is nirvana. What, what does it mean by nirvana? We, we're always talking about in Mahayana, oh, you know, don't go towards nirvana, come back into this lifetime and to practice to deliver sentient beings as if nirvana is a negative, has a negative connotation to it, you know, like kind of going into um, a way station or something that's there. And we, we don't really understand it. Like, what is nirvana? Anybody want to venture a guess? Yes, Mark. You can unmute him. Um, could you raise your hand so that I can see you and then I can un unmute you? Sorry, sorry. I'm trying to find you, Mark. Okay. Thank you, Santa. <laughs> It's the uh, the realization or the awakening to truth. And then what? Then what? Just this, the mind. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? There's not a right or wrong answer, by the way. So you pass the test. <laughs> the, the reason I ask questions of people is for you to participate, but also for you to think about what I'm saying so that it's not just simply, I'm, I'm giving you a lecture on something. I want you to kind of like think about this because this is going to be the main point of what I'm going to be talking about today. And it's going to go from this very ABC's lecture into some really deep quantum mechanics calculations. And just, it won't take long. So I wanted you to kind of at least orient yourself as to where I'm going and looking at it and saying, you know, what, what is nirvana? Um, a lot of you don't want to say because you're afraid of saying something wrong, but, but it's okay. There, this is not something that I'm holding up and going, go to the head of the class or nothing. It's just to try to orient you. Yes, wrong Chen. As Gilbert, my question is, this nirvana is the the perpetual state or the ultimate state. I mean, mind is always in a nirvana state, but it also has all the functions. And uh, our life, our pursuit of Dharma, the ultimate goal is to achieve nirvana. So, uh, so I'm wondering whether nirvana in this has served both ends. Okay, the, a good comment, thank you. Harry, you're next. Yeah. <clears throat> So according to the Lankavatara Sutra, uh, nirvana is the uh, ending of the, uh, the mind's tendency to make projections. When, when projections cease, um, there's nirvana. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, but then there's nothing. I mean, you're, you're no longer adding or subtracting from reality. It's, it's not, it's, nirvana is not different than where we are right now. We just don't see it. Is 
I, I'm, I'm measuring my words with what you're saying um, in terms of it, uh, because when we talk about this and we say, okay, well, it's not neither adding or subtracting to reality. Is that really the case? Or is it that we're neither adding or subtracting to the phenomena and that we call reality, which may or may not be uh, exist? And so it, it's an interesting thing. I understand you're pulling it from the sutra and looking at it. Um, but it, it's something that I, I want to use your comment for people to think about and, and to, to try to do that. And I thank you for your comment because it's something that um, as I looked at it this week in terms of nirvana, I, I realized, yeah, th there's like the textbook definitions and, and then there's this feeling part and we'll get into that in a moment um but i what i wanted to do is if i got into it right away everybody's going to be lost i i guarantee you but it, but if i kind of ease you into it then i think it will work i'll get to you in a moment mark then um one definition is uh, being extinguished or blowing out um th this is in poly nibbana as well um and and so it's something that in terms of us and, and we're saying okay, what, what is it that we're blowing out? You know, are, are we, we blowing out um, the, the world, the self? Um, no, it's interesting because that, that, that got me into to contemplating deeper and deeper with everything. And it's kind of a, um, something that in terms of looking at it, uh, I don't want to suggest any answers to you. I want you to, to really open up your mind because when we get to this next section, you know, you're going to need that uh, contemplative side. So Mark, what, what do you want to add? Well, you, you, I think you just elaborated to, but you asked me, you know, what happens next? And so, yeah, then the notion of the self ceases to exist and you, you become, you, you're absorbed by the mind. You become one with the mind. Okay, good. All right. Now, um, I'm going to refer to um, the Sutra of Queen Shramala uh, Devi, the Lion's Roar Sutra, and um, where Nirvana is, is talked about. Um, and again, I, it's something that is uh, a bit uh, more profound, but hang with me and we'll, we'll get through this. Um, this is from the chapter five, uh, the one vehicle. And um, I'm just going to uh, edit a few things here for you to, to listen to. And it says, uh, oh, Lord, acceptance of the true Buddha is acceptance of Mahayana. Why? Because Mahayana brings forth all of the good acts of the world and of the transcendental. Um, then it says, therefore, Lord, abiding in Mahayana, one accepts Mahayana. So here, if, when we change that Mahayana, not to necessarily the, the school of practice, but to the Buddha, it makes sense. Because what it's saying is have faith in mind, have faith in the Buddha. And, and that's very important here that where they're talking about this, the true Dharma is this acceptance. And that's very, very important because that faith is critical here to be able to enable the mind to, um, to neutralize uh, mental impressions or states or formations as one peers into to one, which is mind, to the extent that there's no longer a one. And um, so we'll continue on here. Let's see. Uh, the terms here that, that I'll use is arhat. Um, sometimes in Chinese, it's referred to as lohan. It is a, uh, someone that is very well on the, the path of, of being an enlightened being. The, the arhats do not um, manifest the great vow. So they're distinguished a bit, but they do have a great understanding of how mind works. And Pratikya uh, Buddha is, um, is a Buddha of someone who without benefit of the Dharma has uh, uh, 
essentially seen their own nature and, and understands how things work, but they have not uh, developed or been exposed to the profound uh, wisdom uh, of, the, of the Dharma. So you're going to hear those names quite a bit uh, juxtaposed against uh, uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Um, and it says uh, that Arhants and uh, Pratika uh, Buddhas are afraid. Because these Arhats and Pratika Buddhas still have not extinguished their lives, these psychophysical forces continue. Interesting. That's the first time I've seen a word like that show up in, in a Dharma. But they're talking about these psychophysical forces, meaning that when we look at things, it, it relates directly to the law of dependent origination, why things appear, whether they're mental states or whether they appear as some kind of form that's there, they, they perceive it to be something that exists. Um, they have not completed the practice of purity and so remain impure. Because of their actions, um, uh, are not ultimate, they still have actions to perform. Because they have not reached the final stage, they still have defilements that should be severed. Because these are not severed, one is far from the realm of nirvana. Why? Because only the Tathagata, uh, perfectly enlightened one, attains final nirvana. And so this, there's a distinction here. And by the way, this is Queen Shramala, and she's expounding on the Dharma uh, to the Buddha who's listening and is very, very happy at, at her dissertation of the Dharma, um, which is interesting too. And it's one that's good because in, in Mahayana, we have this, this female uh, actor that's involved and in, in, uh, in uh, setting forth the Dharma, which is very, very, um, uh, to me, it, it's very progressive in terms of Buddhism, you know, especially going way back when this was done, um, maybe a, a couple of thousand years ago. So we continue. Um, being in, so the reason um, it, they attain final uh, nirvana is being endowed with all merits. Arhats and Pratika Buddhas are not endowed with all merits. When it is said that they attain nirvana, this is merely skillful means of the Buddha. So it's interesting because one could say, oh, you know, I, um, I have attained nirvana, and the Buddha would say just by that very comment, you haven't. Um, and, but the thing is, is it's kind of like putting the carrot before the horse to make the horse move towards the direction that you want them to move in. And this is what the Buddha is doing here and saying, get to nirvana, get to nirvana. Um, and, and, but it's something that we're, we're following this path. Because only the Tathagata um, attains final nirvana, being endowed with inconceivable merits, Arhants and Pratika Buddhas are only endowed in conceivable merit. So here's a difference here where it's a distinguishing in, in nirvana that there is, let's say, two stages. One of them is that one is endowed with conceivable merits. Now understand these conceivable merits could be well beyond the uh, the conceivable merits that a general practitioner or non-practitioner would have, even in their in their imagination. But if one practices and looks at things, you can get a sensation or a feeling of how broad mind is, but yet still this is a, a conceivable merit, something that's there or conceivable visualization or whatever. And this is beyond that. It's inconceivable. And because, and there, and we'll get to why in, in a bit, but, but this is the distinction. So the nirvana has this 
capacity to to engage arhants and uh, pratika buddhas, but on a higher level than is the Buddha level. When it is said that they attain nirvana, this is very interesting. So it says, when it is said that they attain nirvana, this is merely the skillful means of the Buddha. So it's saying, oh, you know, it, these arhats and these uh, pratika Buddhas, they attain nirvana, but not really. But it encourages them to practice deeper and deeper. So it's an interesting thing because it's a little bit of um, a bit a bit different that it's kind of like going to Disneyland and you're in line for two hours and you turn the corner and you think you're going to be and you see the ride there and as you turn around you see that the line goes on for another 1200 yards and you go oh but but if you if you thought that way you you would be very disappointed but at that level then there's still work to do because only the Tathagata attains final nirvana, eliminating transgressions that should be eliminated and endowed with supreme purity, arhats and Prita Buddhas, uh, who still have transgressions, are not supremely pure. When it is said that they attain nirvana, it is merely the skillful means of the Buddha. Again, they repeat this kind of like a, a refrain saying this is just uh, that. So, so when you get to nirvana, you know, after you've been exposed to this, you know, you still have um, uh, uh, a little bit longer in line before you can get there. Only the Tathagata attains the final nirvana. It is revered by all living beings and, sur yeah. and surpasses. Um, uh, hold on. Um, let me start again. Be because only the Tathagatha changed um, final nirvana, eliminating transgression should be eliminated and endowed with the supreme purity of the arhats and, and uh, Pratika uh, Buddhas who still have transgressions and are not, oh, I, I think I read that part, I'm sorry. When it is said that they attain nirvana it is merely skillful means of the Buddhas, only the Tathagatha attains final nirvana. It is revered by all living beings and surpasses the arhat and Pratika Buddha and bodhisattva realms, so even the bodhisattva realms. Therefore, arhats and pratika buddhas are far from the realm of nirvana. So it's kind of like a pre-nirvana. Uh, when it is said that the arhats and pratika buddhas meditate on liberation, uh, have the four wisdoms and uh, ultimately attain their resting place, this is also skillful means of the Tathagata and is taught as an incomplete meaning. Why? There are two kinds of depths. And um, what are the two? They are ordinary death and the inconceivable death of transformation for a purpose. Ordinary death refers to living beings who, who live in unreality. That's kind of like, Harry, that's what I was kind of mentioning to you about that. Uh, whether it's reality or, or not reality, um, the inconceivable death of transformation for a purpose refers to the mind-made bodies of the arhats and pratika buddhas and greatly powerful bodhisattvas until the time of their supreme and complete enlightenment. So it's very interesting. Let me read this to you again because this is a whole bunch here. So it says the inconceivable death of transformation uh, refers to the mind-made body. So the mind-made bodies, again, we're going to depend on origination here and seeing that these things were created by the mind. So the arhats, everyone is created by it. And it's saying these mind-made bodies, there's a transformation, okay, which I hear is referred to for sake of comparison as a death, but a, a different kind of a death than the physical body death. Um, and I, I want you to kind of like dwell on these words and say, okay, well, this is what's happening. 
your body is made uh, by the mind. Everything about you is made of the mind. You didn't do that. You know, you may have put the cookies in your in your mouth that made your belly swell, but that's all causes and conditions. The cookies were made by the Buddha too. So blame it on the Buddha. Okay. So it says, um, um, the, within these two kinds of death, ordinary death, through which Arhants and Pratika Buddhas have completely attained the knowledge said to have extinguished their lives. Okay, so that here comes in this idea of extinguishing the life and blowing out the lamp, I guess. Um, because they attain realization, nirvana, with a remainder. So here's a here's an interesting one. It's kind of like like uh, dividing um, uh, nine by by six, right? And then you've got a remainder. And you go, wait a second, this doesn't quite work out. I mean, why didn't you give me a three to divide into nine? And I wouldn't have a remainder. But you've got a remainder here. And so, so that's what's happening. I'm trying to put this into regular language so you can kind of follow along. There's still something there, like a tail that's there that can't pass through. Um, it is said that practice of holiness has been completely upheld. Because their errors and defilements have been eliminated, it is said their actions have been completed. Actions which the common people, God's seven kinds of educated people, are incapable of performing. So they're saying, okay, well, they made it this far. And they went beyond all of the educated people, even the magna cum laude people can't get here. This is just for the, these who have perfected this far can get into nirvana. But it's still, let's say, I would call it a pre-nirvana. Because Arhants and Pratika Buddhas cannot be reborn since their defilements are eliminated. Very interesting because they're looking at it and saying, you can't be reborn. Why can't you be reborn? Because in the whole sense of things, you can't be reborn because there is no further bija seeds coming through um, from the eighth consciousness to create a, a life and being. Now, the only thing here that's a little tricky is then how do we get through to the Bodhisattva vows? But the, the idea of to be reborn, um, I, I really believe that it has nothing to do with the physical reborn, but it has to do with, with the notion of a life and being, that somebody coming back as a Bodhisattva um, then as, as a true bodhisattva would not have the sense of self. And so, so you could not call them as being reborn. So I wanted to kind of get that out because I've been working on that, um, you know, uh, for a couple of days and, and trying to see how that works. Okay. Since their defilements are eliminated, it is said that they, they are not reborn. When, when it is said that they are not reborn, this is not because they've eliminated all defilements or exhausted all births. Why? Because there are defilements that cannot be eliminated by arhats and pratika buddhas. So this is getting really interesting here. Hang in there because I know that this stuff is heavy. But but hopefully you you can just stay with me with this because it'll give you at least to taste more of what nirvana is so that if people ask you what's nirvana, you know, you, you're just kind of like kind of fake it. You know, I don't want you faking it. I want you to try to really kind of get into this and, and understand this because this is important. If you can understand these principles, when you go to read the sutras, the sutras are just going to open up and explode like this. 
wonderful lotus flower opening up and and give you all the wisdom that's there rather than just this narrow band of uh, intellectual wisdom so here we go um and uh, sorry. um it was what they were saying was that they have not eliminated um, all the defilements. And they say there are two kinds of defilements. What are the two? The first is latent defilement and the other is active defilement. There are four kinds of latent defilement. So this is important. The latent, latent means something that's kind of hidden or it's not directly seen. So, so this latent defilement is pretty much entrenched in there. Um, and that the first one is a stage of false views of monism. Monism, M-O-N-I-S-M, um, means that uh, if people believe that they are at, um, at one with the Buddha, um, in a way and where the Buddha is a supreme being, this is erroneous. And this is a very common um, mistake. It's a natural mistake that, that people do and they'll go, oh, Buddha, please help me pass this test or whatever. Or, uh, and, and it isn't, in this way, there, there isn't a supreme life and being that we're, we're getting to. And this is critical in terms of us understanding this. You, you really have to, to penetrate this, that we see the Buddha in an anthropomorphic way, in, in a way in which we create the Buddha in our own image. And as a result of that, uh, creating the Buddha in our own image, you know, and the thing is, we haven't really changed that image for about 2,500 years. But that was, okay, this is the way we set that. But if, if we hold on to that, we're in error. That's why the Diamond Sutra was saying, you know, don't see the Buddha by his 32 marks. You're, you're going to miss it. And, and so the Diamond Sutra was uh, kind of rectifying um, what was said before. And they're saying, oh, the Buddha has these 32 marks. And, and then the Diamond Sutra comes along and says, yeah, that might be an appearance body of the Buddha. That you would see uh, a Buddha in this way manifested in this way. But that's not the Buddha. The Buddha we should not refer to as a person or an entity or a life and being, even if it's a superior life and being, you're missing it. If you do that, you're missing it. The Buddha is this very mind that you're using right now. It's not different. Just like Ling Chi said, that the the um, the mind of the of of the patriarchs and the Buddhas are no different than the mind that you're using now. It's mind without calling it mind. And it is why they called it the Tathagata, thusness to avoid it being called anything. This is, this is very, very important because we cannot call the Buddha Buddha. We cannot see the Buddha as a Buddha. We can see an, an appearance body. Let's take Christianity, for instance. You know, um, I, I, have a very strong sense that they kind of borrowed this trinity, although there was other trinities uh, along the line. But if you would say, oh, well, Jesus is God, you say, yeah, Jesus is God. But does God look like Jesus? You know, um, I, I don't think so. How could he be Jesus? And, and I think Thich Nhat Hanh said, God is God when he doesn't think he's God. And, and there's some, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but it's still also very important to look at that, to say that otherwise it's just an ordinary sentient being. The reason I'm bringing this up is not to, to, to attack Christianity. 
what I'm doing is trying to break down your ideas that might have been formed and might have been influenced by Judeo-Christian or whatever other belief systems that are there, that there's a supreme being. And we're pretty good at that ourselves to kind of advance that and, and to hold the, the Buddha up, you know, to such a high esteem, which we should. We should do that. I'm not saying don't have people say, oh, Gilbert said that that the, the Buddha is, is this, you know, shouldn't have as worthy of respect. Absolutely. But in right view, we have to see exactly what Buddha is, which is mind. And again, without calling it mind. But this is the difference in this pre-nirvana and a full unconditioned nirvana is when all preconceived notions are, are gone, even those that are hidden very, very deep. And one of them is this monism. The, the second one is um, desiring um, sense pleasure. So this idea of having some kind of uh, a sense pleasure and the opposite being not desiring unpleasurable things like pain um but when we have a desire so pain is the opposite of, of the sense pleasure um but being in the human realm um we get a bit of both so there's a lot of dissatisfaction in our lives because we can't always feel like we have this wonderful wonderful feeling around us and um so but we have this craving for it and all of these, again, go to the, the 12 Nadanas as well. The third one is the stage of, of desiring form. Like we want to have some kind of a form. Um, we don't feel complete without a form. And, and it's kind of interesting because when they talk about the three uh, uh, realms, they talk about the realm of desire. A realm of form and the realm of no form and and you really kind of need to contemplate that um and say what are these forms these forms is it, some things have no form some things have have a form um and then some things have a desire strong desire and 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 they're creating this idea of a form a a, a ghost oftentimes will will superimpose itself over some inanimate object as well as other people by the way um uh, this is not going to turn into a ghost story but i just using an example that a ghost could um could uh have a house as as its form have you heard of a haunted house probably never right um but if you're ever in a haunted house, run. But seriously, but in any case, uh, it could be a tree. Um, they, they'd rather have some form than no form at all. And, um, and so, but do they have a form? Not really, but it, it's just an illusion, but they feel comfortable in that way. I'm not just saying no form has to do with, with, uh, with ghosts. It could be a god that has no form, just simply uh, some kind of a consciousness that's there. So it's kind of an interesting thing when we look at it, but we, we have to see this because we have to kind of compare that to, to the Buddha and say, why are they saying these things? And what I'm trying to do is tie these all together for you so that it, it can enable you to contemplate more. I don't really expect you guys to get this completely tonight but what i want to do is plant the seeds for you to to really contemplate this and kind of like get you know um like a, a like a little tiny pebble in your shoe not a big rock but a pebble that just you you know it's there and it kind of bugs you that you haven't resolved it you know and you're trying to determine whether you're too lazy to take take your shoe off and drop it off or just walk around in it and um so i think that that's probably directly related to how old you are and how lazy you are how long you leave the little stone in but here you know when you're when you're practicing 
you have to you have to really be aware of that kind of look at that let just know that it's there and and try to look into it um this is the contemplative aspect again here do not confuse contemplation with um with cogitation or deep profound cogitation um contemplation is just looking directly into mind with no idea of a linear thought. You cannot catch um, mind by laying um, a fishing line out with a hook. It's not gonna take it. So you, you have to, the only way you can do it is, is a, be absorbed by mind. And this is a contemplation is a way of being absorbed. Okay. Um, so we went through um, the monism, um, the sensual pleasures, desiring form, and the last is desiring existence. This is a very interesting one because when we look at this, we realize that deep down in us, we want to continue on. We, we want to do that. We just want to wear a better suit or better better clothes than we're having right now and so we carry this notion this very deep notion inside us and it's entrenched in there all of these are ignorance okay santa yeah but i just wanted to um you know, turning away from desiring sense pleasures, turning away from desiring forms and desiring existence can, you know, in a, in a, in a shallow kind of a way can result in that dead wood, cold stone. Um, I, I just wanted to, 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 to bring that up because there, this can be misinterpreted. This, set, this is happening at a certain level and the, the level that is, happening in is after the the nirvana with remainder um, um so in, in this teaching is for um you know those who are not scared of um it, from from before those who are not scared of sense sense um pleasures or forms of or of continued existence Yes, I understand that, but as I see it, there's not anybody that is listening to me today that's not capable of, of uh, getting a benefit from this. And certainly the benefit of listening to a profound dharma like this is they make a connection with it. So even if they don't get it in this lifetime, they'll, they'll develop an affinity for it. But those who do not hear it can take a long time to do that. I understand what you're saying, but I... I feel, yes, this is very, very deep. Um, I told you. I'm not, I'm not saying that this should not be taught. I'm, 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 I apologize for coming uh, across that way. I'm just saying that it should not be erroneously interpreted as um, therefore cold stone and um, dry wood. It, sh it should uh, not be dead wood. So it should, yes. I'm just saying and, that and it should not be misinterpreted. Thank you. You're right. And quite the contrary, it, it actually. Um, illuminates everything and rather than this this you know when we talk about wall gazing we're not making the mind disengaged with anything what we're doing is that we're we're looking through that to the wall itself which is mine but it, it does not negate anything there it is just simply um through its profound uh, um a wisdom as able to see things as they are as clearly as they are that we, we are not we understand where these things come from in the mind and as we visualize them we know that uh here um the uh, queen Shramala is is laying this out and going look this is this is something that you need to begin to prepare for that you have to see that these are the fundamental uh, uh, ignorance that's there, this uh, nascent entrenchment of ignorance all the way deep into 
uh, into mind, but it is what distinguishes the nirvana of a arhat and a pratika buddha or yourself and um, penetrating all the way through to a complete enlightenment of the buddha. And so it is this that's really, really important in terms of how we look at this is to see that this um, uh, ego, this life and being personality, the self-conceit, self-centrism is at the root of everything, even at the level of a Pratika Buddha or an Arhat, there is still a sense of an attainment and there's a sense of, of something there and and the buddha is just buddha there there is no attainment there it is not a mental state this is very interesting and again i'm i'm talking to you in a very deep and profound way um, but I hope that you'll stay with me and, and contemplate this. It, it, it is, as they were saying, even the Pratika Buddhas, they, their understanding of this, their wisdom is conceivable. Their idea of the, of the Buddha is conceivable, but the Buddha itself is inconceivable. It's beyond anything that that can be done every once in a while maybe you can get a realization or a peak of that but it it is just uh the, the briefest of moments that that one would would be able to do that for 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 most people but thank you for your comments it isn't a dead mind it isn't letting go of everything it, it's looking through it to see things as they are let me continue on i, I got just a little bit more time um so it says from these these are static defilements they they call it here latent defilements but they're static they're 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 there kind of imprinted into your cosmic dna okay it's imprinted in there already on all appearances all phenomena have this kind of a cosmic dna in in it and what it, it is the the dna is it's an illusion but we we are so rolled up in the dream we believe that this dream is real we knock on the table and we say it's solid how could you say this isn't this isn't real but um i hope the next time when you're in a dream and something's chasing you, you have to wake up and say this isn't real this isn't real okay um from these four stages of defilement, there are all active defilements. What is active is momentary and associated with momentariness of the mind. And this is for a pretty good definition. I really love this definition where he's saying what's active in terms of defilements is it's momentary. It just, it's like, uh, it just appears. Um, like a subatomic particle, a quark. I know they have some beyond that now, um, or smaller than that. But it's just like a quark. It just it appears for just a flash of of you know the smallest amount of time, and and we see it, um, and we believe it to be real, and it connects to something else. Therefore, it appears to have a continuity, but it's just a momentary appearance in mind and and that's important as we begin to look at this and you begin to understand how mind works okay so then we continue um the mind does not associate with the stage of beginningless ignorance in the same manner the power of these four latent defilements is uh, a basis for all active defilements but cannot possibly be compared in number, fraction, counting, similarity, nor resemblance to ignorance in power. This is an incredibly powerful statement that's here. It's saying all of these appearances, all of these active defilements, and you 
you took them and you timed them times infinity, it's still not as powerful as this fundamental ignorance. That is the most powerful thing. And, and this is important for us to understand because now we know what we're up against. Um, no, we're, we're up against the, the best team on the other side. They're incredibly, it's incredibly powerful. Knowing that is, is important because when we underestimate the enemy, I'm calling an enemy in conventional sense, uh, the opponent, then we, we um, make too many mistakes. But when we understand the nature of the opponent, then we're able to, to uh, overcome that enemy. Oh Lord, such is the power of the stage of ignorance. The power of the stage of ignorance is much greater than other stages represented by the fourth stage of desire of existence. The power of the state of ignorance is like that of the wicked evil one, Mara. And it's interesting here, so they're conjuring up this, this uh, um, evil one, Mara, to, to say, you know, hey, I'll even bring out the boogeyman to shake you up with this, but it is what Mara is afraid of. So, so if you think Mara is an evil one and really you just say ignorance and Mara will shake in, in the boots. Whose form and power and longevity and retainers are both superior to and more powerful than um, the heaven where God's control enjoyments created by others. So they're going, whoa, this is more powerful than the gods in heaven. And true, because the gods in heaven are still samsaric. They're limited in their understanding and wisdom. They still have ignorance. Otherwise, they would not be in a samsaric realm. So this is very powerful words, and I'm trying to break it down for you to see how, how this works and how you can apply it actually in your daily life and in your practice when you're sitting and you're understanding that you're there. And in that way, what you do is you, you convert all of the appearances that appear when you're meditating from ignorance to wisdom. There's no secret to that. That's what Shakyamuni Buddha did under the Bodhi tree. Everything that came before him, he converted it to wisdom. He saw through it. He did not negate it. He didn't make it blank. Um, he, he saw through it and transformed it. That was the transcendence, the transformation, the enlightenment of the Buddha was seen through all of these things and seen that they are all created by the mind. How could the mind not defeat it? But this is a profound wisdom. Unfortunately, because of causes and conditions, we're so wrapped up in that, that we cannot see our true identity. So we do not have the power of the Buddha to overcome this. If we try to fight it as a samsaric being, we cannot do it even if we try to fight it as a Pratika Buddha. It's not enough. So to me, this is an incredibly wonderful and profound in terms of, of what's there because it's, it's telling you, okay, this is how you practice. You don't have to wait to the stage of Pratika Buddha to practice in this way. All you have to do is see how mind works. Okay. Um, its power is far superior to that of other stages of defilement represented by the fourth stage of desire for existence. This base is, is for active defilements more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River causes of the four kinds of defilements to continue for a long time. Arhats and Pratika Buddha wisdom cannot eliminate it. Only the Tathagatha's enlightenment wisdom can eliminate it. Yes, O oh Lord, the stage of ignorance is extremely powerful. 
the three states of existence arise conditioned by clinging to existence and by defiled actions. So it, it arises by clinging to existence, wanting to be something, and by clinging to it and then uh, essentially producing defiled actions based on that, on that um, wrong assumption continues the whole process. And let me get to a little bit of the last part here, because uh, this part's kind of important. Um, because all things are conditioned and not conditioned, very interesting. And this is, you'll only find this in a Buddhist sutra. Because all things are conditioned and not conditioned, the three kinds of mind made bodies and pure actions are conditioned by the state of ignorance. So when we look at things and we see that there is a, a realm of desire, form, or no form realms, all of those are conditioned by ignorance, that they come into being because of ignorance. Uh, the other stages of defilement represented by the fourth stage of desire for existence are not identical with the stage of ignorance with respect to action. The stage of ignorance is different from the four stages and is elim eliminated by the Buddha stage and by the enlightenment wisdom of the Buddha. Why? Arhats and Pratika Buddhists eliminate the four kinds of stages, but um, their purity is not complete for they have not attained autonomy nor have they accomplished their realization of enlightenment. Their purity is not complete, refers to the stage of ignorance. Um, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. There's, um, there's a bit more, but it gives you a, kind of a feeling for this. And you start seeing that even at the higher levels, there is this kind of a stage, you know, so when you're sitting there and you're meditating, you're going, oh, I'm almost there. I can feel it now. You know, don't do that. Just, just practice. And practice correctly uh, when you're meditating you see everything like a wall gazing everything projected on the mind but you see through it just like it's transparent I think we talked about that before uh, like a transparent mirror and so you see it in this way when you meditate you keep your mind calm your your senses are not titillated by the appearances you're not you're just seeing through it understanding all of this is in accordance with Pratika Samapada. It's clear in everything that you see, everything that you do, likewise, it is in accordance with Pratika Samapada. So you see things, you still belong to the samsaric world, you still have to eat, you still have to bathe and, and change your clothes or whatever, but you, um, you understand that mind is beyond these these appearances and these dreams. If you can do that, then you can you can course through this world um, uh, with this deep prajna paramita, and, and that's what's important. So this is just today food for thought for you. So whatever you pick up is fine. You know, it's just something that I wanted to kind of give you more of a contemplation and look at it from from the real deep end. And, and, it, and it came from the idea of wanting to know what nirvana was and um, in terms of it. And, and um, I kind of was led to this particular sutra and, uh, and, and it helped me a lot in terms of, of understanding uh, what nirvana is. And, and I think that that's something that hopefully it will help you. So you shouldn't eschew it or say, oh, you know, nirvana is only for Theravadans, but on the other hand, you shouldn't see it as a complete goal that there, even if one was to uh, achieve nirvana, there is a, a conditioned nirvana and unconditioned nirvana. Unconditioned nirvana is the complete enlightenment uh, of the Buddha mind. So that's where we'll stay uh, today. Uh, again, you know, it went a little bit deeper, but in this kind of a class, uh, I uh, 
I, I like to, to go deeper than I could do on a regular lecture somewhere. So I uh, hope you, uh, you you benefited from it. Let me tell you. Any questions? It's question time. So you all understood it. <laughs> Wei Xiang, please. Um, I want to continue with uh, what the sensor says about this uh, uh, conventional uh, understanding of a nirvana or what you said about the condition in the nirvana. Um, I think it's only uh, when there is attachment to this uh, condition in nirvana, our absolute aspect of mind, it become the dry wood. Uh, and uh, uh, a cold oh, stone. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make that comment. Um, but f in terms of dry wood, a uh, cold stone, and the uh, conventional, uh, I call it conventional, conditioned nirvana, they should be different uh, because nirvana by by me by uh, it's it's free of any defilement. Uh, any thoughts, and uh, uh, it should be extremely freeing and uh, um, expensive, uh, more expensive than uh, the cold stone and the dry wood. Uh, but the attachment to it is the problem. That's yeah. the that's cold the, stone. Yeah, the cold stone and dry wood doesn't lead you to nirvana. Um, it, it's it's the opposite. Um, the the thing here is that. Uh, this particular sutra is is very profound and it's just fine tuning that last little bit so it's good but yeah that's the correct understanding thank you okay harry oh you're muted um uh there we go uh thanks gilbert i thought this was really a great session you really uh gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, one thing was in, in pursuing nirvana, it made me think of that phrase from the uh, Tao Te Ching of uh, those who know um, don't speak and those who speak don't know. So anything we come up with nirvana is going to be like that. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to share, because you began with the, um, the three characteristics. And I, I think this is pretty interesting. There was a Zen teacher or a Zen, there is a Zen teacher named Lou Richmond who had viral encephalitis from sick for many years. And when he <laughs> recovered, um, they asked him about the three characteristics. And um, what he said is, he, the, these were his phrases for it. They're very interesting, which is, everything is connected, nothing lasts, and you're not alone. Um, you, you have to think about this for, you know, because everything is connected is, is really no self, not self. Um, uh, nothing lasts is kind of self-evident, but you're not alone is quite interesting for, uh, you know, for covering suffering because we usually think we are alone. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's his interpretation in terms of it's like saying mind or no mind. You know, he just flips it, but the, the intention is still there. In terms yeah, I just thought this is, these things are so, you know, we work on this all our lives. So anything that you know, and any other angles could be helpful sometimes. Yeah. Lives plural. <laughs> <laughs> lives. <laughs> yeah, life, yeah, many, many lifetimes. What I what I my goal is for those of you who are listening now is to uh, to really give it a big push in this lifetime. And uh, um, no, it it's something that I think that you're capable of doing and to listening to the, uh, um, the right view and, and applying it um, is very, very important. So uh, these kinds of things where we're, we're looking at it and we re-examine the idea of our, our um, viewpoint as to Buddha, it really changes because if we, if we start looking into it, in, in a way in which you see the Mahayana Sutras where they're saying Buddha can't be known by 32 marks. That's your, your uh, um, 
starting off point in Mahayana, but then you have to go, you know, and keep going further and further into it, into the Buddha mind. And, um, and, and it's kind of like um, one of these movies, these fantasy movies where somebody's walking off in the distance and they begin to fade away. It, 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 sometimes it's like that. Other times it can be just boom and, and you, you're gone. Um, and, but it's something that is helpful as long as you don't cling to it, like the Gama Sutra, the, the last uh, uh, section of it uh, on demonic states, as long as you don't cling to any, anything, then it will work. But if you cling to it, then you, you really mess it up because then you're walking around thinking that you're the embodiment of the Buddha. Um, when we say the mind is a Buddha, the mind is a Buddha, but it, it doesn't need this this shadow puppet to uh, to speak for it. So, wrong ten. Oh, unmute oh, there he is. yeah. Just a question. I, I appreciate your uh, clarification. Is uh, first of all, uh, how much the stage of the Ignorance is related to the four latent defilements. And when the person, when the boot, uh, when one is a uh, conditioned nirvana, so that, that's still some stage of ignorance, right? So, yeah, and, and it is that um, the latent defilements, and, um, and it, if we refer to it, as a latent defilements, then we're still outside of it. it. It is something that the purity of the mind is uh, letting go of everything, including the notions of these latent defilements. They, they simply would not come up anymore. There's no kind of a sense of, of, of self or a life and being or a spirit or a soul or anything that that one could cling to um, that is trying to aspire or to attain to get anything. And it's kind of um, um, counterintuitive to the way that we practice in, in our lives here. We study and study to get a degree, get a job, get married, whatever. We're always trying to progress through life, you know, and thinking that this is the meaning of life. And, um, and so we're all always goal oriented and here we're goal oriented, but in a different way, it, it's not, it has nothing to do with the self, nothing to do with, with where we go with all of this. And, and when, when I am not Gilbert, I'm a much better citizen of this world. When I'm Gilbert, you know, I'm thinking for about myself, thinking about my problems and, and I've said many times I can suffer with the best of you, you know, uh, but um, no, I try to minimize his participation in my samsaric life at, at this point. And it seems to, to help. It, it helps not just uh, uh, me. I have no concern about that. What I want to do is make as, as good use of my time that I have with this body although I don't want to cling to the body and say, oh, I want to be around for 120 years or whatever. Uh, I want to make use of, of it while it's here and then, you know, move on from there. But when we practice in this way, we're not far from it. If we feel that we're not far from it, then we're really far from it. But if we just simply practice and let the Dharma, um, be demonstrated by our actions, then we're not far from it. And, and, and we, this is kind of the path. We will get there. If we think there's a path, then we mess it all up. Uh, if we think there's a path through intellectualism, for sure that's not going to happen. But studying is, is, a, is a virtue. No, but we know for what reason do we study? And it's not a matter of us to say, oh, I get it. You know, no, you, you don't get anything. No, but it's something that should be pressing on us. Uh, that pit, 
the parts of the Dharma that you don't understand. When I was first starting to learn the Dharma, I would underline all the time like I do now. Later on, when, I, when I'd pick up the same book, I would go to the parts that I didn't underline and realize the reason I didn't underline it was because I didn't understand it. <laughs> and and so, so that's the part that I concentrated on because I realized that I didn't understand this. Of course, this is something I could understand, but this over here was much, much deeper. And I, was, I realized it's a kind of a trick of the mind to try to keep you kind of staying with the same stuff. That's why I try so hard to give you different things, you know, um, different uh, facets of the diamond for you to look into so that uh, one of them will hit for you, you know, and every once in a while, I'll, several of you will, will, will have some kind of, uh, of an uh, uh, insight into it by, by hearing what I said, but that's, that's what we do. I don't study for my own self. I study for, to have the, confidence to to um, to present the dharma but thank you Rojan. any other questions that burn you guys out can be on anything it doesn't have to be for tonight no why well, i'm impressed I, I you guys got it all oh yes go ahead julia Did you? Oh, she's working on you. Did you? She put up her hand. Yulia put up her hand and then uh, made bet came up. Now, where did Yulia go? Um, really stupid question. I, I was kind of listening and I kind of was, I think, following until Santa said dry wooden cold stone. I have no idea what that refers to. <sighs> Oh, okay. That it's just simply saying that that when we look at things, we should not be thinking about them in terms of um, of a nihilistic aspect of emptiness. That it's not something saying we just turn our back on things and we don't see them. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, this. Is kind of a very mundane example, but I, you know. Uh, when I go to retreats, there's a lot of people that, uh, especially if they're coming from the Zen school, uh, as opposed to the Chan school, they will, at the breaks, they'll face the wall. And, um, and so it's kind of like, like this kind of a practice where one is, is not wall gazing, but just simply blocking, blocking out the sensory things because it will disturb them. To me, I'm thinking, if you're working well on your cushion, you can navigate through um, getting a drink of water and going to the bathroom um, and be fine without having disturbing your your uh, your practice. If if simply you know getting a drink of water is going to disturb your practices, you're not doing very well on the cushion. And um, so uh, so it's something saying we don't block our mind. Um, this it, it's it, it's the exact opposite is what I'm doing, and she's just giving the admonition: be careful. You know, some people may may interpret that as being just blocking your mind and not thinking about anything, which is not not the case. That's what she was talking about. Okay, and I think Yulia was. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good, because I could not unmute myself, sorry. I do have probably two questions here. Um, the first one about the um, latent defilements. Here she's talking about the stages. Uh, is she really referring like, to the stages of these defilements? Like, you know, the stages in sickness, you know, stage one, stage three. So Arhats and Pratika Buddhas, do they have to um, eliminate, you know, ex Extinguish them, extinguish them in stages, or they just all disappear at once when they finally, uh, you know, pierce through ignorance. So, like, yeah, it, they're elements of uh, of let's say a static defilements. Um, 
you know, weakening one may weaken all of them. Um, and, uh, or all of them may all disappear at the same time, depending on how one practices. Mm. To me, I would think that it's, um, uh, uh, when I've made some progresses in the practice, it's been simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's not like stage one, stage two, it's not like that. It's just elements of things of, of defilements. And those are under uh, the umbrella of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And then, and then from there that produces the active defilements, which are just all the little buggy things that happen to us all the time that, you know, that happen or cravings or whatever. Okay. So uh, that's, uh, that's it. Okay. That's that helpful. It? Yes. Okay. And my yeah. second question was, um, when she's talking about two types of deaths, you know, the ordinary death, and then she's saying the inconceivable death of transformation for a purpose. So I'm like intrigued by that little thing in parentheses, which, you know, says for a purpose, like what is this inconceivable death of transformation for a purpose? Well, the, essentially the purpose is, is uh, uh, the dropping off of, of all defilements. So as, as we're doing that, you know, we, um, we're working towards what we would call attainment, but there is actually not attainment, but it is just uh, the um, uh, reaching of a state of Anjara Samyak Sambodhi, which is this profound wisdom, which actually cannot be defined as wisdom itself because it's simply the, the uh, functioning of the Buddha mind, but that is the purpose. So when we can do that, then we know, otherwise, if you, if you suffer a small death, then you just get uh, churned back into the samsaric realm. You may come back as a god, uh, a diva, a human, you know, um, an animal, uh, a ghost or a hell dweller. And um, so we don't know which one we're going to get to depending on our karma uh, forces. So, you know, we, it's best to practice as much as you can now and uh, perhaps have a choice as to where you're going to go. Okay. But that's the purpose. Paloma. Yeah. I have, I have two questions. Um, one, uh, tonight you have spoken about nirvana, liberation, and enlightenment. Are those synonyms? Yes and no. Um, you know, they, they can be in, it's, in, in its ultimate understanding. Oh, Harry, you got your, your mic on. Somebody had it. I was okay. Let me go back. Um, so you have. Um, I'm sorry, I, I lost my my train of thought. Uh, just to and, um, nirvana, liberation, oh. and enlightenment. Is it the same? As I mentioned, yes and no. You know the, and that's why it really drove me to kind of um, uh, peer into nirvana because I wanted to know. Okay, well, how does that fit? Is that a state of mind or is it something to a Pratika Buddha or an Arhat, then it still could manifest as a state of mind. But to, um, to a Buddha, the unconditioned Nirvana is, is, is nothing other but complete enlightenment. And uh, so when we, we understand it in this way, then it's fine. But we understand here, you know, that there's still some work to be done, even if we get to, to, uh, to Nirvana, um, we, we still have that. But the very fact that you're exposed to it, you could go, it's just like people who are meditating and they'll go, oh, I remember Gilbert told me to stay on the method or whatever, you know, you, you still have that practice that will help guide you. So it's beneficial, even if you, you know, you don't consider yourself to be a Pratika Buddha, you know, you, you still, um, have this training already, which is, which is necessary. So the thing is, is that it, what, what I would like you to do, Paloma, is really pour into and say, 
just in fact, what is a Buddha? What is this? I mean, that question I probably raise every single day, uh, you know, um, in terms of examination. I no longer am trying to describe it in words. I just simply use contemplation and to um, to do this. This, this particular class um, was difficult for me to prepare the um, uh, in the Queen Shramala Sutra part because my mind just kept um, just I don't know it just began just becoming clear really clear and and it was actually hard for me to function to to stay on it because I I kept falling into contemplation of the words that I was reading and um, and not contemplation like what does this mean it's just will will take you away like a like a helium balloon into the sky and and that's what i want you to do i want you to try to look at it and 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 um you have a very great creativity you don't have to imagine anything just let it go and see where you can go with it okay okay and i have a second question all right uh a, a few weeks ago you talked about those uh, Christian or, or more like Catholic um, theologians like Merton, for instance, that reached the concept of Godhead, but couldn't go any further. Is that what you are talking today about, a Pratikya Buddha? It, it just needs to go one step more. It's very close, you know. Thomas Merton is, is more contemporary. Meister Eckert uh, uh, was someone that I'm not talking about Eckert told, please, but Meister Eckert um, uh, was uh, from um, I forgot several hundred years ago, but but um, they all were bound because of the fact they had to interpret everything and write everything in the context of the Christian religion. And so they weren't able to get further, but you could you could call them, you know, in in some ways, Pratika Buddha, especially Meister Eckert, uh, who who was uh, his writings are very incredible. But you can see that they're they're confined, you know, especially in in the environment of a, a strong Catholic uh, religion at that point. I mean, it was either that or he gets burned at the stake. So. Um, it, uh, it was limited, but I think that he had more, more to say than what he could say. But yeah, I mean, it, it, that would be a good example. People like them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. John, good to see you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Gilbert, for your lecture today. Um, I remember you mentioned uh, several times that uh, Chen is actually a verb, not a noun, right? So, uh, so I have a follow-up question as to the uh, uh, like uh, cold stone and dry wood. I say if we run into someone who like is always uh, blocking their mind, uh, is there any suggestion as to how to get them to move along? Yeah, I, I think you have to to define um, that this is a uh, like we had said before the. A, a, uh, a devil's cave or, or just a dead cave and and you have it you they can just talk about how everything is just like empty and I run into a lot of people that go I don't have any thought you know and I, I, I'm there but you can tell that their mind is stagnating and um, and and nothing is happening um, you can do that you can induce yourself just to block your mind and and it's very powerful and the only difference is is that when you come out of it there's no progress um and that uh, it, it's just the same old place but when you when you actually can practice well everything is a little bit different everything looks a little clearer you know, probably the best way to say it is that everything is clear. You understand more about what's happening in the present moment. You can see all these little tiny nuances that you, you weren't able to see. It's as if you could see the grass uh, in the lawn growing, 
um, you're you're so aware of everything. You know, you you're aware of of the the bugs in the lawn, the clouds going by, the shadows, everything. You know what people are saying, how they're looking. You know the everything is more acute, more aware, and and that's the difference. And that awareness comes from sitting um, in a state of awareness. And when you're sitting in a state of awareness, the mind is um, is very is very clear. The only thing is because it no longer follows the images that are arising within it is aware of them, but it's also aware of the uh, almost countless potential ideas that want to come into mind as a thought. That's kind of almost like looking into the eighth consciousness at the bija seeds that are just saying, pick me, pick me. Mm -hmm. And so you become aware in, in that state. Um, I cannot emphasize that enough how powerful that is that you you can see these things at, at the potentiality of things and that's the other part is the potentiality that of what will happen next via your body speech and mind that if you do this this will happen and your mind is making these things when you have a dead mind none of that is accessible to you you, you're just stagnating. And so you, you're stagnating in the life, it, you know, it becomes a still life, you know, like some kind of a, of um, a masterpiece still life of a bowl of oranges and apples, you know, with the sun hitting them, but nothing's happening. You can't taste the oranges or the apple. No, but in, in uh, when the mind is totally aware, it's aware of everything. It's clear of it. It, and, and that's the difference and that's what you have to to let people know you know if they how they describe what they're doing and it's very common john is and i'm hopefully you can use this in some way i'm kind of giving you more detail way because i know you 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 present the dharma and teach meditation but a lot of people make this mistake they just want to block their mind out and then they sit they can sit for a long period of time but there's no progress you know, um, they're just simply practicing their legs and turning off the, the light like as if they're sitting in a refrigerator and the door closed. It's cold and, and dark and they're happy with that. And um, so you just have to tell them that this is this is not this is not productive. So they, they have to get out of that, unlearn that state because it's a very easy state to fall into. It's kind of like a record and putting a record over a, a, a needle over a record, it'll find that groove all the time. And, and, and it's difficult to make it jump out of that groove. Um, so uh, the sooner you catch people with that, the, the better it is. You know? and, and in your um, presentation of how to meditate, that's probably one thing you want to say, one of, one of your earliest lessons, okay? Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Very good to see you. Um, okay, I think that's it for today. Thank you guys for listening. You know, um, I hope you benefited as much as I did in giving this lecture. I, I transfer the merit to all of you so you can in turn become beacons of the Dharma. Omitofo. Take care. <laughs>